Welcome to session number three of uh, Avian Archaeology. And um, this one, as Linda said, is the third session still focusing on turkeys, but a really uh, different approach tonight. First of all, we made it as complicated as possible. We put everyone in a different city <laughs> and different state even. Um, so uh, give us a break if we have <laughs> a little bit of complexity. But uh, tonight I'm in Yuma. Um, Yuma, Arizona, and I'm on an advocacy trip with uh, Skylar Begay promoting protections for the Great Bend of the Gila. And as I came out here today, um, passed through um, that Great Bend of the Gila area, which has 13 tribes with heritage connections to it. Um, and I'd like everyone in their uh, home, wherever they are tonight, to take a moment to contemplate the debt of gratitude that you owe to tribes whose ancestral lands you're settled on tonight. And in thankful mode, I also want to thank the Gene and Eldon and Jay Smith. The Smith family's living trust is the what allows this uh, series of uh, Avian Cafe to uh, go on this year. So thank you. Uh, Eldon, Jean, and Jay. So our two speakers tonight will start out with Bill Light. Um, and I condensed his uh, resume, which was like 17 feet long, um, <laughs> into uh, a much shorter. Uh, Bill is well known for uh, his decades of research in the Four Corners area. He, he serves on the board of the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center and is an emeritus professor at Washington State University. And he also found time to uh, be the president of the Society for American Archaeology. So service, intellectual en energy, and uh, um, just an amazing career. Uh, and now turkeys are uh, a favorite for Bill. And uh, Mary Wiaki, uh, Comanche, and Santa Clara Pueblo is an archaeologist at the Office of Archaeological Studies at the uh, New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs. And I think you're going to be enchanted by the pr presentation that she does tonight. So I'm looking forward to uh, both of these speakers tonight. And uh, thank you all for, for coming to hear about turkey feather blankets and ancestral Pueblo history. So we'll let Bill Light take over things here. And uh, I'm going to sign off for the night. I've got a, many things I'm juggling tonight. So um, happy new year to all. And thanks for everyone who's on the uh, uh, session tonight. OK. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about turkeys, which is what I do a lot of recently. Um, I'll start here with just a quick list of uh, some of the many people who've made my research on ancestral Pueblo turkeys possible over the last 10 or 12 years. So it's a long list, but I couldn't have done it. What I've done couldn't have been done without them. So I just want to flash this on the screen before going on. Um, I want to start with um, a little bit about uh, North American wild turkeys, Miliagris galapavo. It's a single widely distributed species with several subspecies. So this map that you see here was made by A.W. Shorter uh, that based largely on, partly on historical records because at the time he made it in the mid 20th century, turkeys had been thoroughly decimated by overhunting. The Wild Turkey Federation has subsequently built up the populations again. But this, uh, the, the, uh, Subspecies we'll be talking about, it will include uh, the Merriam's turkey, which occupied much of the same area uh, that where we find ancestral Pueblo sites and communities today. I think it probably extended into southeast Utah at one time, more than shown here. The, the intermediate or uh, Rio Grande subspecies it goes all the way down into northeast Mexico and the eastern subspecies, which it covers a huge area in the eastern U.S. Also mentioned the uh, South Mexican wild turkey, which became the uh, domestic turkey that the Spanish conquerors uh, 
took to Europe where it became popular. And then that uh, birds of that subspecies were brought back into the America, the North America, where they became the the beginnings of the commercial turkey raising industry. So that the turkey uh, that we buy in a store today comes from uh, this uh, South Mexican domesticate. But what we want to talk about is a different domesticate domesticated by ancestral Pueblo people in the greater Four Corners area. Um, another important, an important paper was a survey of the mitochondrial DNA of the subspecies by Karen Mock in 2002. Um, mitochondria are little inclusions in cells that help generate energy for the organism. They have their own small genomes and are useful for ancient DNA work because uh, there, are, there are lots of them in most cells and they're very small. So uh, unlike nuclear DNA, which is in a single nuclear, <coughs> single large uh, bundle of chromosomes in the nucleus, they typically, mitochondrial DNA is typically inherited only through the mother. Both, both males and females inherit the mitochondrial DNA, but only females can pass it along. Another uh, background in biology is uh, comes from a study that Camilla Speller did when she was a graduate student at Simon Fraser University. And in her dissertation, she analyzed the mitochondrial DNA of uh, turkey remains, mostly bones from archeological sites all over the uh, Southwest area, all over the ends, upland Southwest, and also one sample down here from down here in Chihuahua. One thing she found surprisingly was that most of the archeological samples fell into a single haplogroup. It is a group of uh, related, closely related lines of mitochondrial DNA. Uh, here, the size of the, the bubbles are just this number of specimens analyzed, but this is the primary finding. She also found that uh, uh, many, actually most of the archaeological samples also had a few, usually a small percentage of uh, specimens that probably were from the Mer Merriam's uh, subspecies. Anyway, the uh, Speller's results contradicted the two previous main theories for the origin of Pueblo turkeys, which had been recognized for a long time that the Pueblo people were keeping turkeys. One, that they were introduced from central Mexico, and second, that they were domesticated versions of local Merriam's wild turkeys. This uh, study uh, can combine with Mock's uh, mitochondrial DNA study of subspecies indicated that the H1, the uh, ancestral Pueblo uh, turkeys were probably more closely related to Rio Grande or Eastern populations of, of, sub, of wild turkeys. Uh, so that they uh, were not from the Rio, from the, from Mexico. And it also, they also showed that there was worse, in fact, some Merriam's turkeys that were typically being treated like domesticates uh, uh, by the ancestral Pueblo. So it's a complicated story, but a really uh, interesting one. And it sort of revolutionized the uh, study of of, of, of ancestral Pueblo turkeys. Some archaeological background. Uh, I really just want to talk about the uh, the uh, earliest dates for the H1 haplic group from late basket maker two context in Grand Gulch, Southeast Utah, first couple of centuries AD. This is Grand Gulch in, on Cedar Mesa, where uh, our Cedar Mesa project that R.G. Matson and I ran for years did mostly surveys, but some testing. This is Turkey Pen Cave, a very large dry shelter. And it has a ledge here that some has some Pueblo structures on it. And down on the, the main level, there's also some Pueblo two and three structures. But looking down from the, from the uh, ledge, you see a large level area down on the floor of the cave, which is sort of discolored. That's a heavy uh, midden deposit. And much of the midden apparently was deposited during the late basket maker two period. Finally, this is just a shot of the, what's, what people have, visitors have called the turkey, the turkey pen, which dates to the Pueblo two or three period and uh, you know, 800 or a thousand years uh, later than the earliest uh, turkeys from the midden. 
the Grand Gulch and other canyons of Southeast Utah were subject to a lot of excavation. Uh, I'm not sure whether you call it archaeology or call it just collecting artifacts, many of which ended up in museums. Uh, in the 1890s, very active uh, uh, work at that time period. This photo shows uh, is of uh, Richard Wetherill's party in camping in Grand Gulch in 1897. Uh, he was, of course, well known for uh, bringing Cliff Palace and other cliff dwellings in the Mesa Verde uh, to public attention in the around 1890. But he also did a lot of digging in Southeast Utah. Wetherill's party dug in Turkey Pan Cave, but not extensively there. Wetherill's notes say, the debris seemed too much for us to work in the limited time we had. Also too filthy, it was composed almost entirely of desiccated turkey droppings. And here are uh, some of the turkey drops, some examples of these dried turkey droppings. The context here is just completely uh, dry. And uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that my, co my colleague R.G. Matson did while I was uh, running the surveys on the Mesa, had a small crew that dug a single test pit in uh, the, the, the midden. And uh, we exposed a uh, column about 50 centimeters square and about a meter and a half deep. And we actually bagged up the, uh, each layer and brought it back. So that brought the whole layer back. All that material now is at the Museum of Anthropology at Washington State University. We also got lots of dates. Uh, this shows a, uh, from, a from a different study, uh, the corn cobs that were dated by AMS method that indicated that this uh, rather thick midden accumulated rapidly between about AD 1 and 200. So that gives us a good date to work with. We also uh, saw evidence uh, that feather blankets started becoming standard individual possessions by early ancestral Pueblo people in the early years AD. That is about the same time as, the, as we got the dates on these uh, uh, turkey droppings in the Turkey Pen Cave. Uh, the, uh, the reason that uh, turkey feather blankets became popular was the uh, characteristics of the feathers. We see here selection of feathers from wild turkey, but they would, were very similar to what it would have been found in the uh, H1 uh, domestic turkey. Uh, about uh, three quarters to uh, four fifths of the, uh, of the feather is uh, downy. It's only the solid tips that one sees on the exterior of the turkey, but underneath are these uh, downy feathers, the downy portions of the feathers that keep the bird uh, insulated from both heat and cold. Um, and the ancestral Pueblo turkey feather blankets replaced earlier blankets made of strips of rabbit skin wound onto a framework of fiber cordage. See, it, uh, see this example at left. This is a man from the Mojave tribe in the lower Colorado in the early 20th century in a uh, blanket made of uh, strips of rabbit fur. So the turkey feather blankets were made in a similar fashion, but by wrapping turkey body feathers around a, uh, the, the cords in a, a, a cordage framework. We also think that the uh, blanket feathers were probably usually obtained by directly from, from birds. Uh, the mature body feathers of large birds like turkeys uh, uh, lose their connection to the nervous system and the blood supply in preparation for molting. So they can be obtained, can be collected several times a year as with the goose feathers in this example from the right from a, a small firm in, in Chile that uh, specializes in, in uh, goose down. Uh, so so that the, the bird typically molts uh, all its feathers uh, uh, a couple of times a year. Uh, or, you know, it, it molts all its feathers in uh, a series of molts during the year. So uh, sort of a sustainable resource if they can be obtained without killing the bird. In the, until the late 80, 1100s and 1200s, only small numbers of turkeys were kept, probably a few per household to supply blanket feathers and for ritual uses. Most archeological occurrences from 81 to 1100 are, are burials of complete birds. And here's an example 
of a, of a uh, buried individual turkey. This is not the uh, clunky wooden dart that killed it. This is just a measuring device that is aligned with uh, showing north. Um, there's also an example from the same from the same site that dates to the uh, basically to the 900s and the early 1000s of the of a, a ritual that involves sacrificing turkeys and other animals, probably at the closing down of this particular underground room. This is looking down into the excavation and you can see the remains of several adult turkeys, a number of chicks or poults, several dogs or puppies and one snake. So this is a good example from of the ritual use of, of turkeys. And turkey feathers, of course, are still quite important for ritual purposes in the Pueblo communities today. But a big change happened in the uh, late Pueblo II and Pueblo III periods in the northern part of the Pueblo world as population increased and aggregated in large villages, such as the one shown here. Deer became scarce because of overhunting. Turkeys and small game became important sources of meat for the first time, but uh, not necessarily a very efficient replacement. It takes about 55 cottontails or nine turkeys to equal the amount of meat from a deer. But this just shows a uh, comparison of uh, a couple of, uh, uh, of a village site in the dated primarily to the 8900s with a, this large Pueblo dating to the mid 1200s. You see that the great increase in the number of turkey bones and a great decrease in the number of artiodactyl, primarily deer bones. So the last couple of slides here talk about the analysis we did of an 800 year old ancestral Pueblo blanket. This is the framework of the blanket made out of yucca fiber cordage that was is on display has been curated at the edge of the Cedars State Park Museum in Blanding, Utah. It's amazingly well preserved, even though the insects, insect larvae have eaten away the, the downy part of the feathers. Um, I'll get to that in just a minute. This shows uh, myself and a couple of others analyzing this framework. It also shows another blanket that's at the edge of the cedars that has most of its feathers intact. This is a close up of a portion of the edge of this blanket that shows uh, the, uh, the warp cords uh, that have been stripped of the downy portion by the beetle larvae, probably domestic beetles, but it's still possible to see the spines of the feathers. And we were able to identify individual feathers where one started wrapping and the other and where it ended and counting the number of feathers along a portion or sample of the warp cords. So we estimated based on these this sampling, we estimated that about 185 meters, that is a couple of football field lengths of yucca fiber cord were needed to make this framework and that approximately 11,500 feathers had been tightly wrapped onto the warp cords, as you see here. So we also counted the body feathers from several wild Miriam's turkeys and estimated that an adult male would yield about 2,700 feathers between four and 20 meters, centimeters long. Keep in mind that these uh, would have been shed uh, annually between a couple of bolts uh, so that turkeys continually uh, replacing their feathers. From this, uh, we estimated that uh, four and a half large turkeys could supply the 11,500 feathers needed for a blanket. And we think that the turkeys that were kept in households were probably, uh, uh, feathers were collected from them several times a year and then probably saved in a bag or in a pit and then uh, brought out when needed to make a blanket. That's really the end of my uh, portion of this talk, but uh, Mary will take it on from here and discuss uh, how these uh, blankets of this type were actually made and uh, what the amount of work that goes into it and uh, that, that sort of thing. She's really a, a, the leading expert in replicating these blankets. And in fact, a demonstration of hers that I saw probably six years ago at the Crow Canyon Center really motivated me to do 
a lot of this research on this blanket that uh, reporting here and in an article that we published just last year. So thank you and turn it over to Mary. Here we go, Mary, it's all yours. Well, hello everybody. And how do you come in after Bill Leip? You know, that's, that's a trick in itself. Um, I learned a lot from uh, Bill along the way about um, the animal and it's uh, how uh, turkeys got up into our part of the country up here in uh, the northern Rio Grande Valley. Um, one of the things uh, about harvesting feathers in his small uh, that he talked about, um, I did not have the luxury of having the herds of turkey um, that it took to create the blankets. And I can understand how valuable these animals were to the villages because I just, what I, what I replicated was uh, a two foot by three foot blanket and the amount of cordage that it takes to um, produce that blanket. Like he said, it's not just feet, it's miles of cordage. And we, we, we use miles because you get a better idea of that. Uh, it took 87 um, yucca plants. So you go and you collect your yucca whether it's dead and down, it, it, um, yucca is like one of the only plants you can harvest year round. And we get what's called roadkill yucca. So construction sites, we're always eyeballing for yucca. Um, people's yards, if they, if they find it invasive, I'll go get it. And then you take each yucca plant apart, leaf by leaf, and you take the needles off, the deadly part, and you start a process of um, simmering the leaves at 225 degrees for two days straight. Uh, we learned by accident that if you froze them and, and rethawed them, that the ice crystals break, the, break up the interior of the leaf so that when you go to clean it, it makes it a lot easier to clean um, after the two days of boil. So here's a, a cooked leaf and it still has the, the skin on the outside, but I test it by just rubbing my um, thumbnail on it. And you can see that I get this uh, silicate off and then I can just take it all the way off. And then I've got all this great fiber on the inside of my leaf. And this is what I'm, I'm, I'm getting to make my cordage to create the turkey feather blanket. One leaf produces three feet of cordage. So when you're making the thickness of the cordage, you wanna make sure that you have plenty of yucca fiber. So to make those um, miles of uh, beautiful cordage that you're gonna need to create your uh, blanket. And all this is hand spun on your thigh. So if you have a hairy leg, it won't be hairy anymore. Uh, it'll hurt for a little bit, but then after that, you'll be okay. Or you can shave it, your choice. But this really does grip anything on uh, your skin. I've heard people say they could do it on Levi's um, or you could, you know, but it really, uh, anything, everything has to be worked wet. So just remember that while you're uh, wearing your pair of jeans or whatever you're trying to spin your cordage on. Um, so here's some that I have that I can show you real quick um, how it's spun. This is yucca cordage here. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera a little bit down, downward. And I'm gonna show you my thigh. And so I'm getting the cordage and I'm just gonna use the palm of my hand and I'm gonna roll both of these at the same time. And it's gonna create a S spin on the yuck. And you can see it starting to spin. And this is when you tell yourself, it's good to be Indian because I don't have any hair on my thigh. 
So I, that little bit of um, spinning that I did right now, just that little bit of rolling, I created at least five to six inches. And that's a lot of practice. So when you're thinking about this blanket, all that yucca has to be spun first before you can um, start applying the feathers. So once you have your yucca um, cordage completed, you can go ahead and start um, separating all your feathers. Again, not having that luxury of um, that uh, turkey, that's the difficult part. So when I did it, started this project, um, a lot of the feathers were donated and they used a machine. And I've never seen the machine, to be honest with you, but I understand you put the bird in this machine and you turn a handle and it takes all the feathers off so you're stuck with the bare bird. What that machine did was it kind of damaged some of the, the fletch, it kind of bent it. And it's almost like if you've ever worked with river cane, once it's bent, it's hard to, you can't use it. So I had to pick through all these feathers and choose one, the feathers that weren't damaged and make sure that I had the right, um, the right uh, length of feather. So in Bill's PowerPoint, you saw uh, feathers that were uh, 17 centimeters all the way down to, um, I'm plucking this feathers right in front of you, all the way down to five, which is, is here. Both of these are desirable. And what I mean by desirable is that this edge here with all the fluff on it, this is what I want. I want a feather that has enough down so that when I wrap it, this will, will fluff up. And this is these are good too. Um, when I start going through feathers, I use all my desirable feathers first. And then I get down to, oh my God, I'm down to these little guys. So the amount of coverage on the cordage, you start using more of these, you start having to use larger counts of, of, uh, of feathers. So um, mine ended up being um, like 17,000 feathers on a two foot by three foot blanket because I was limited to, uh, to seven, 17 um, centimeters of feather length or 10 inches to 11 inch feathers. And these you can do, but you start to feel every small muscle in your hand as you start winding because these you get smaller and smaller use, but you can use them. I mean, I had to, and I, and I proved that it can be done. Um, but when I had this opportunity um, to harvest feathers from a live bird, I took it. I got a hold of the Department of Game and Fish out at Fort Sill in Lawton, Oklahoma, it was the first time I went to go harvest feathers. And these birds were from hunters bringing in um, Merriam's and Rio Grande's. And so I got to see the different um, feathers that I could choose from. These soldiers would just said, uh, we only want the, the wings and the tails and the turkey um, spur and, and the breast. They left every other part of the turkey. They were just discarding them like in the trash can. So the ones that came in and got measured and weighed, and uh, I got to see the age of the bird. I got to see the weight of the bird. And I got to actually, the, the birds were still laying there and they were warm. This sounds terrible, but their bodies were still <laughs> warm. So I went and flipped birds and looked at where the desirable feathers were. And were the ones, since they were all toms, the preening feathers, like this is a preening feather. This is off the back. And it's a beautiful um, bird. And, uh, you know, I prayed for each bird and gave my cornmeal offering and thanked the bird for what he was going to give back to me. And then uh, I kept some of the bones uh, to make flutes uh, for the elders. Um, but I have a, a 
this is what I was working with over there, which is this beautiful uh, pelt. So if you know how to skin a, a bird, you can get the whole bird, even the wings, the tail, the whole, the whole pelt is available to you. And I didn't throw or discard any feathers that were too small. They can see some of these are pretty, pretty small feathers. Um, because in the village, the people still use the smaller feathers. I, I call them the lesser feathers. So every part of the bird got used. Um, even the wings and the tails for the wing, uh, tail feathers for uh, headdresses for women and the wing feathers got used for um, weapons that we, we do the replica work on these as well. So this is river cane and Apache plume and um, also making uh, waterproof um, jackets with the uh, wing feathers. But uh, as far as the desirable feathers on this, this pelt probably is gonna give me about 600 to 700 desirable feathers just off of this uh, tom. So I, I get really excited about when someone gives me feathers or, or I get to go collect them. One of the other things I learned from collecting birds, um, I went with the biologist out to uh, uh, a golf course in Raton. And this was my opportunity to pluck from live birds. So uh, they netted 35 birds, I believe that day. And as soon as the net hit these birds, because they baited them with um, corn and everything out in, the, in this golf course, it was pretty crazy. It was snow on the ground. It was beautiful out there. And then you see this net go boom, covers all these birds. And then there's this little explosion of feathers. So they were releasing as the net hit them. They just knocked them off these birds. So I ran out there like a crazy lady with my bucket and I started picking up all the loose ones. And then as the rangers held these birds in their arms, I expected the bird to flinch, first of all, when I grabbed the feather. And they didn't even flinch, no wince, no anything. So now in my head, I could visually see my ancestors just freely um, plucking the birds and taking the ones that they wanted, not completely leaving the bird um, naked or anything, you know, that wouldn't be nice for that bird. So um, the other thing I noticed too was as I lifted the tail on these birds, the game and fish guys were like, what is this Indian lady doing? She's crazy, you know? And I wanted to see where the laying feathers, like when they lay on their clutch, when they sit on their clutch of eggs, are those feathers, do they, how do they, uh, those got to be the warmest. So I was wanting to see if, if there was a number of those, but that number was less than the preening feathers or under the wing feathers. So I had to be careful. I didn't want to leave them too much. But one of the other things I wanted to understand was if you pluck this bird, how long is it going to take for him to regrow that feather? It's two to three days. So as I pulled um, this feather out of his little, uh, I don't know what it's a pore, I pulled it out and there's a little hole that's left. And I looked in there like fast. I was like looking in that hole like, you know, and um, you can see another feather on the sides. Like I saw two and they're like have a milky white skin on, on around them. So there's the, the next feather that's gonna come out once he loses his feather. So I had anyone afraid of, of uh, leaving that poor little bird, you know, without anything. Cause I knew that he was gonna be okay. The other thing I learned was out of these 32 birds, there were, various ages of birds. There were six month olds, there were uh, females and males, 
Um, so then I, I went to the little six month old birds and I said, let's see what your feather looks like. Well, they were very narrow and thin and really didn't have much of the desirable um, fluff that you see here on the side. So I kind of left them alone, but I just wanted to see, are they picking birds feathers at six months of age, you know, or are they waiting? The best birds were the birds that were seven years old. They had the best feathers. So once I got all my feathers collected and separated and everything, then it came down to uh, winding these uh, feathers around my cordage that I, that I made. Uh, so the time, it took me 18 months to make that blanket, but it wasn't so much the, the spinning of the cordage or gathering of the yucca plants. It was the gathering of the feathers. Again, not having that luxury and depending on hunters and, and uh, people donating um, feathers or, or even roadkill pelts. Um, I was lucky that I had all kinds of resources. I even bought me a turkey a, a hunting license to hunt these birds, but I never did go out. I, I don't think I could, I, I just couldn't do it because like Bill, I found the love for these animals. Um, there, I can see why we consider them to be so noble. Um, so here's my, here's my yucca cordage and my feathers. These are already on here and they're wet. So again, everything is worked wet. And what the way yucca is spun, See, it opens and closes. So I had to use um, a tool to open the yucca long enough for me to uh, insert this feather. So I put these feathers in a little while ago. Another thing that I learned from dead and down is that with the dead and down bird, I had to soak my feathers at least 15 to 20 minutes in warm water. With a bird that I plucked that day, I could use that feather right away without even less than two minutes. But the only reason why I put it in the water was because a lot of these birds had fecal and tree, you know, grass and everything on them. And I, and because I have all that yucca, I had all that yucca soap. So I washed, um, these feathers get washed in yucca and the, uh, anything on them comes off and I'm happy. So here's my wet feather, my cordage, and I'm gonna pull this tool with my third hand, pull it out, insert, insert that feather. And I'm just gonna wind this around. And I'm actually hiding all these quills and uh, there's a quill there and these fletch ends. So all you're gonna see is actually the, the feather itself, the, um, fluff of the feather itself. And like I said, it looks like a wet cattail, you know, when you when you start to do this. And uh, I'll do one more or two for you guys so you get an idea. So I'm holding it. I'm going to insert my bone tool, separate the yucca, because it's a two-ply spin on the yucca. And it's an S spin, not a Z spin. The only time uh, a Z spin's used is if I'm creating like a four ply. If you look on this end, this dead and down still has fat and meat on it. And uh, so the soaking also helps me get rid of that. So the reason why I soak it is so that this quill becomes pliable. If I didn't soak it, I'd crack it. Remember I was telling you about the, the turkey feather machine that cracks these feathers? It's not, it's not a cool thing, you know? So I don't want this cracked, but I'm gonna go ahead and bite this again, pull it out and while the cordage is still open, insert my feather. 
all the quills are going to go the same direction from the beginning here all the quills go that way and you can see that here and then i'm going to take hold the quill down and i'm going to bend it so now this quill is still going the direction i want it to go along the edge of that cordage see it right there and then i'm just going to wind this on top of that quill and whatever uh, And see, that was a 17. Uh, these are long. These are nice. So they're actually covering only from, from here to here, which is about a quarter of an inch to uh, a half an inch, if I'm lucky, um, of, the, of the yucca cordage. And I can feel it. I feel no quills. I don't feel anything poking out. So uh, it looks terrible because, you know, like I said, it's wet. But uh, once it dries, and, and, and I have a sample here uh, of a feather uh, boa that uh, we use in the office for our education outreach program. So I'm going to go ahead and put this down or compare it. Let's compare it. So this is what it will look like once this dries up. And you can see the fletch ends of the turkey, how it's all underneath here. Um, I just love this. As soon as you touch it, your hat, you just warm up. So if you can imagine a blanket made like this for this winter, it, it's the most beautiful thing you can put on your body. Um, when I finished the blanket, I took it to my village. I'm from Santa Clara. And I showed it to the council. And every man on that council put it on. You know, they were saying, oh, my God, it's beautiful. Sawodi, you know. And they were amazed that, um, that their ancestors used to wear this. And the children in the village, everybody touched it. Everybody touched it. That made me proud. It made me happy. And I took it to the Comanche Nation, uh, and they were excited, and they touched it, and they were saying, it feels like it's alive. You know, the life of the animal is still in it. So there was a, a combination of Merriam and uh, Rio Grande that are in that blanket, and um, it's very uh, elegant, uh, a, a garment, you know, it's very elegant. So hopefully I'll Oh, uh, this sample that I'm making is for uh, a little sample for everybody to touch. It's going to be eight inch by 10 inch. So I have all my cordage uh, ready to go for it. And then I have to put it on a loom and, uh, you know, weave it. And, you know, I just find so much joy and pleasure in this. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this small little demonstration that I did. And I'll go ahead and let uh, the Q&A uh, part of the program go on, unless there's anything else I left out. I don't think so. Um, oh, Mary, that is fascinating. That, that's just, just amazing to see. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Yeah. Um, Bill, if you want to turn your camera back on, you can. Um, you can come join us and we can ask a few questions. Okay, let's start video. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Mary, I had one question. I think it's a really probably an obvious one to everybody but me. But so you, you make the cordage and you do the feathers like that. And then you take the resulting long strips of feathered cordage and you weave it into whatever you want to make it into. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I, I for some reason I wasn't clear on the um, the actual yeah how yeah what I thought maybe they made the whole weave and then stick all the feathers in but okay no thanks I appreciate no. <laughs> it. <laughs> well wow there were like a couple questions until you finished and now there's like twenty questions so <laughs> let's see what we have here um, we had a couple questions um, 
whether there was any specific kind of yucca that you were using to make the cordage. And also, could you maybe use agave fiber to make your cordage? You can certainly use agave. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to extract. Uh, there, the best I've roasted it and, and, and have extracted it. It's more coarse, mm -hmm. but it has longer uh, leaves that you can use. Um, I'm, for this particular blanket, it's all narrow leaf uh, yucca. So um, I think it's bocata, but um, it's it's found out here, and I'm I'm learning. Uh, I mean, I can look at a plant and tell you exactly how many feet I can. I've done so much, how many feet I can get out of it. But like I said, yucca is the only plant you can use year round. Harvest, I mean, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, there's been a couple, oh, we had another technical question. You were talking about boiling and freezing your yucca. No, your leaves, whatever. Yeah. yes, yes. Uh, which happens first? Do we boil or freeze first? Boil. Okay, then freeze. Yeah, okay. for two days at 225 degrees in a turkey roaster, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All things turkey, even the roaster. There's been a couple of questions. People are fascinated or interested in understanding more about the type of loom that you're using when you do the weaving. It's just a basic loom um, with two uh, doll rods on one and top, depending on the length. So I'll make it the length of the blanket or the length of the um, hmm. whatever I'm looming. So that way the doll rods pull out and I can release the blanket easy. Hmm. Kind of like the way you would do a belt, but a little bit different. Yeah, it's a simple loom. I, hmm. Why didn't I bring out my loom? <laughs> anyway. That's okay. That's okay. I'm looking through some of our notes. Oh, speaking of the loom though, um, a weaver's question. Are both the warp and the weft cordage with feather? feathers no. or is it only one way it's only one way okay yeah okay. so you have to do all the warp um for the feathers and the weft you're it's a different and it's a different gauge it's a it's half the size of the warp gauge okay. so this is a common uh gauge for um the the warp for the feathers and the weft is, uh, oh God, do I even have a piece? I can make one real quick. <laughs> um, the weft is gonna be um, thinner or thicker? Thinner, it's thinner. gotta be a lot thinner. So I'll, I'll do a comparison real quick. Okay. Let, me, let me do this. Excellent. Um, I have to tell you too, that you've got a lot of people just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you on our questions and answers, so. Oh yeah. So oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah, so the uh, amount that you use, you're sort of sort of guessing. Well, when I first started, I was guessing at everything, how much I'm going to have to use. So I went all the way across and I said, oh, wow, OK, times whatever <laughs> feet and, and, you know, and then and then spinning it so that you get the right gauge and staying consistent with your gauge. You know, that's that's a learned experience in itself. Yeah, you mentioned, I think, a Z spin. Z is, uh, so Z is, this is S, so I'm coming forward, that's mm -hmm. S. Okay. Z is when you come backwards. Ah. Okay, then, then it will spin into a Z. And when, when you're doing like four ply um, looming or spinning, the Z works for your S against the S spin and it creates a four ply thread. Um, so it's the only ones who use a Z spin when they're making uh, a blanket or anything are the Diné. Mm. Mm. Everybody else uses S, all the Pueblos. Mm. Hmm. There was another speaking of your cordage, you know, so you're making your cordage 
I think I get it, but can you clarify just a little bit more about how do you just, how do you keep making the cordage longer? You when just, you draft it. Okay, so you take uh, the end of your, uh, your spin, see how I have one short and one long? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I come over to my uh, my bundle of, of uh, my big, it looks like horse hair, yeah. you know, it, it's really pretty uh, fiber. And so I'll take uh, some of this and I'll add it to, to this smaller end. I okay. want to keep keep it the same. Uh, I'll look at it. OK, that looks like it. it's the same thickness. And when you're doing this, this is the only time I use a Z spin because I'm locking this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lock this uh, in. And then once I have it right there, I can go forward on it. I'm back to my S. Mm hmm. And it's right here. So now I've. Yeah. Pretty much got it locked in. Yeah. That's the only time. Huh. So that's that's how you're keeping and see see the length now. Yeah. I went from here to here. Yeah. Fascinating. Oh, so <laughs> so many. Somebody, so much, so many questions. Everybody wants to ask questions too. It's just, ah, <laughs> let's see. Um, oh, there's been some question. Um, I don't know, Bill, you may know, but um, is there any evidence of trading the blankets or even trading turkey pelts? Any kind of, any evidence of trade related to turkeys? Know of anything? Uh, Linda, can you see me? Yes. I can't see myself, but. Uh, <laughs> no, um, we can see you. We okay. see you, Bill. Um, you know, you would expect that, but um, I, would, I would suspect that uh, the problem with most of the archaeological work is that uh, blankets are so perishable, unless you're in a dr really dry context like the Turkey Pan Cave, which is completely dry. A rare, it's just a rare uh, a situation in which you can find even fragments of turkey feather blankets. So if they were um, traded out, you'd have to be uh, you know, lucky to find an example. I think there are a few blankets from uh, California that I'd like to, to run down and see if perhaps they might have originated in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the places that could have been traded too, like California, we're still making rabbit fur blankets too. So it's, a, it's also uh, would be a competition. Although I think that uh, Mary has uh, shown how desirable the feather blankets were and how warm and so forth. And mm -hmm. that seemed to work for the Pueblo people who made the shift fairly rapidly from rabbit fur to feather blankets once the birds became available to keep to keep locally. But that's an interesting question because remember that Coronado goes, uh, the Spaniard Coronado goes to the, the Pueblo of Coronado and takes 200 blankets. Now, what <laughs> happened to these blankets? Where did they end up? Who ended up with them? And did they trade them along the way? Mm -hmm. You know, so, I think the technology of the blanket travels because, uh, you know, my way might not be the only way, you know, sure. it was just, it, it's an experiment mm -hmm. from looking at um, what Bill saw at Edge of Cedars and what we have here at the Mayak and other places. So sure. yeah, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit it to one uh, village and then people are marrying yeah. different, you know, you can't intermarry. So you're going different clans. So. Like I said, technology, I think it, it, it travels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A um, couple more questions about the blanket. So do you have any sense of like sort of what temperature, like how cold could it be outside that you would still stay pretty warm in it? Um, well, I was out in um, Pecos in February, like, 
like at the end, right before the, the rainy season, and it was cold. And when I do demonstrations outside, I have to wear shorts because I have to have a bare leg. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, everybody's walking around with snow boots and, you know, and the Rangers have me outside. Here you go, Mayor. You know, we're gonna, this is a great place for you. I'm all like, gee, thanks in the shade outside. Woo. You know, and, uh, it got kind of, it got cold. And I just, I still had that, that, uh, feather blanket with me. And at first I grabbed the rabbit, you know, I said, I can, I can rabbit, we can always replace. And then I put that turkey feather blanket on and I warmed up within, um, I was going to say like 10 seconds and I could already feel my, my heat gathering. Um, so, you know, that thermal part of that blanket is magnificent. Mm. Uh, and this was wind rain you know it was like sleet after a while you're like okay this is i got one more day to do i got to another day of this so, we, so uh, just putting it on it it, it huh. the, the comfort level was was wow. amazing that's great you know uh, eric uh, eric blimben mm -hmm. who uh barry works with Mm -hmm. sometimes for sometimes with <laughs> but uh eric uh, wrote a paper in which he argued based on uh, some experiment also some early experimental work in the in the 80s that the turkey feather blankets were both uh, warmer and more durable than the rabbit fur blankets they lasted longer could be washed and so mm -hmm. forth yeah. it lasted you know multiple years yeah. and were also warmer okay. but there's a lot more work that could be done on that there's been, you know, some more measurements could be done using, say, the blanket that Mary made and so forth. Yeah, I, I think that um, um, Dr. Blimlin uh, would often say the baby blanket, the two foot by three foot is for a little one and you leave an open end. So as you grow, your blanket grows with you. Yeah. So it becomes your birthing blanket and then it becomes your burial shroud. Wow. That, that makes a lot of sense, you know, because, you know, see how I added cordage to yeah. the, the thing. That's all you have to do is yeah. add more cordage and yeah. then add feathers to really? the amount of, right. of a cordage. So in looking at um, the little blanket out at the Mayak, I noticed that it had an open end. So you would just have to undo all the, you know, the, the blanket and then start it all over again. Wow. Yeah. So that made sense to me. Wow. And the durability is incredible. You know, I, I, uh, I believe that, you know, the rabbit fur blankets, eventually they, like now we use tan hides back then they didn't. Mm -hmm. So the membrane of that rabbit fur, as soon as you skin that rabbit, you start stripping it and it's sticky. And then you roll the, the feathers and then you mm -hmm. wind it around the cordage. But now with this tan hide, it, the, the hair of, tends to fall off quick within seven years i say eight years you guys that used to own a rabbit fur blankets pretty soon you're just buckskin you know <laughs> it's all over the couch it's everywhere so with the turkey feather blanket i'm finding out that you don't lose the. and i mean this blanket got touched by a lot of people yeah. and the, my grandkids ran around with it you know it was like crazy <laughs> it never lost the feathers yeah wow yeah so. so how long if you had you know all your cordage and you had got all your feathers so you had all the things you needed how long how long does would it take you to make like like a full-size blanket for a grown-up do you have an idea I'm going to say if I had all the resources mm -hmm. it would take me less than a year now that I know what, what it's doing. And I was working, I tried, I tried doing like eight hour days with the thing, but oh. your hands, you find out how many um, fine muscles you have, you know, doing this, doing this, uh, you know, and, um, and then you have to do your, your, your chores, you have work, you have, so whatever mm. minutes you have to at least put five feathers on a day to, you know, uh, a whole bucket. Yeah. It, it's, it's your it's it's the pace is up to you okay. really but i'm going to say i think it would take um maybe less than a year if you had it all together instead of hunting down everything like i had to do so this is clearly it's an investment of time but once you've got it like you said 
it's your blanket forever. It's yeah, it's exactly. Forever, right. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone in the village wants one, by the way. Yeah. And it's just like, uh, I can't make you one, but I'll teach you. I was say, you need to teach them. Yes. I have an interesting comment from Janet Cantley at the Herd Museum. She wondered if you'd seen the turkey feather boots in the collection at the Herd. I, I haven't. I've seen photographs okay. and I would love to mm -hmm. because that's what I want to make next. I'm an accomplished sandal maker. Mm -hmm. And I would love to make that muck look. Wow. Um, I'm sure Janet would be happy to show them to you. They, she says they're made with yucca fiber. Cordy. Yeah, they're yucca. So. And it's a loop. It's a loop weave so that it's stretchy like a sock so that it opens. Uh -huh. And then you can put your foot in there and it's waterproof. That's why I said, and it's all wing feathers and the wing feathers, you know, you dip them in water. That's why they use them for arrows, because if the blood got on them, they just, you know, come right off mm -hmm. and then they, it wouldn't lose balance. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that like, you know, Bill, I'm learning more about turkeys and how they're the feather utilization of birds. So. All right. I'm just answering a quick question. We have some people who missed us. <laughs> Oh, we're, we're running out of time here. Okay. I'm trying to think if we have any other last minute questions we should ask or, well, one person, some, we've had some people were asking Mary is, um, what is your background? I mean, do you have a lot of experience with doing fiber and, and all of this kind of stuff? Did you come to that with, with that kind of experience before you did learn this Turkey stuff? The, the only thing with that spin on the thigh was, um, Growing up with my grandma in the Pueblo, who used to respin cotton string from the dog food bags and the, the bean bags and the flour sacks to make um, deer dance leggings ah. and things like that. So I would, you know, mess with the string with her and then spin. And then my Comanche grandma says, uh, you know, the little girls played with bows. So if you can make a bow string, you'll never go hungry. So um, she brought out the sinew and it spun the same way on your your thigh and the, the spinning te technique I, I i knew how to do it right away so I, I found that easy yeah um but other than i'm not an artist i'm not you know i don't i just like experimenting yeah. and i've learned quite a bit you know everybody the this wow. lady this weekend told me why don't you make that cordage and sell it I said, why don't I teach you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we had what? We were pushing almost 300 people here tonight watching. Wow. This. And um, everybody, wow, Bill. <laughs> everybody was really um, enjoying it. Um, just so many, so much positivity. Everybody says thank you so, so very much to both Bill and Mary for this, this, this experience that that was really quite quite fun thank you thank you and I guess since Bill Doley isn't coming back it's up to me <laughs> to say thanks to everybody who's still here for coming and um don't forget to come back again next month um January 4th new year we're gonna leave turkeys for a while and we're gonna talk about ducks uh oh <laughs> Holly Shasma is going to talk about ducks power and San Juan basket makers. And when she first proposed this uh, topic about ducks, she titled it about ducks on people's heads. So I'm really curious to see what she has to say about the basket makers and ducks and, and images of ducks and basket maker time. But so we'll see everybody back on the fourth. Like Bill said, happy holidays, everybody. Thank you, Mary. Thank to you, you Bill. Bill. Merry Christmas. Yes. Merry Thank you all, and thanks everybody for coming.